Right, thank you for joining our talk. Um, my name is Huan Ming Qian. I'm, I'm joined by Chen Wang from IBM. Um, it's our pleasure to meet you here, and we are going to share, you, uh, share with you what we have uh, done for the sustainable cloud AI. Uh, first of all, uh, the agenda of the talk is that we are going to share how we deploy cloud AI, especially using foundation models, and what we can learn by measuring the power, uh, power performance and power metrics uh, to discover what is the best way to optimize energy consumption for foundation models. And there are certain future work directions we are going to explore. And this will be including a demo from uh, Chen. Um, so first of all, we just want to have some overview of uh, what's the energy impacts and the environmental impacts of foundation models. As years goes by, and you know, this is all, even though this is only five years since the first large language models uh, from other institutes, the other models was introduced, we see an expo exponential growth in the foundation, in the large language models. So the four metrics evaluates large language models, the size of uh, the parameters, basically the connections between neurons. Uh, we see that's grown from 94 million um, all the way to legends at uh, GPT-4 has a 100 trillion parameters so in only five years. That kind of growth is surprising. On the other side, if you're looking at the, um, the neural, the models, training cycles, what's the cost? You know, the cost can be a um, monetary cost or environmental cost. Looking at the numbers, that's, this was, we got it from the Meta's paper. The training cycles, the, the amounts of energy and of carbon footprints included in these training cycles. Uh, this is still quite impressive. In the early days of OPT's, uh, OPT, uh, that's for Meta, we are using uh, 137, uh, 137 tons of uh, carbon. If you just consider the standard is that's a, um, a car using five tons of carbon every year. That's equivalent to 40 cars driving in a year. And if you are keeping getting bigger and bigger models in the future, the amount of uh, carbon that's going to be incurred it's not something small. So we want to do something in that direction, but we are not going to talk about the, the training. We are talking about the inference. Uh, so this is the paper from Hugging Face. Uh, so we see here, there's two main dimensions. The X um, dimension is the number of requests in a 10 minutes interval. So if you have very highly bursty traffic, uh, the, you get less intervals that you go into the left side, the closer to zero. The Y axis, is the energy consumption uh, by that server at the moment. So you see here, there's a big cluster as the corner. So we see two things. One is that uh, even there's no request, we still spend, the GPU still spend a lot of energy on idle, on idling. So that is not something trivial. If you have a wonderful server serving a wonderful uh, model and you are not receiving a lot of requests, you are still spending a lot of uh, uh, energy on idling. The other that's um, most of the energy being spent actually being capped. So you can potentially put a power cap uh, somewhere in the areas you believe the best. Uh, but in our later um, presentation, we will see that power capping is not always working. Uh, so a quick discussion of what's the model we are using in our uh, evaluation. So we're using Bloom. Bloom is a model from uh, Bloom is a model from Big Science. You can get it from Hawking Face, and this has a multiple variations. You can have a smaller ones with one, uh, with only a few hundreds millions of uh, parameters to the big ones with, uh, with uh, 176 billion parameters, and you can scan the QR code to get the Docker file, and that's the step number one. As we have. Uh, the talk this morning, the keynote talk in the morning. Uh, many of the data scientists, the machine learning, uh, mod, machine learning uh, developers, they are very good at building machines, uh, building the models. But oftentimes, the end users want to have the workloads to be able to deploy it on their own environment. So Docker file uh, is the first step to get these things done. So when we are able to containerize the model and the serving then it becomes more affordable and more accessible for the end users to use them. So we're also using the stable diffusion model as well. And the, this is our QR code for the web UI and the stable diffusion uh, Docker file. So again, this is very um, helpful for the end users. If you are, you know, for example, if I want to run stable diffusion on my laptop, 
and I do not want to replicate everything in the hugging phase. I can just run it as a container, and that will solve a lot of usability issue on my own local environment. And if you are running the workloads in your um, you know, production system, containerization is also the first step to make it happen, to make it uh, cloud native uh, accessible. So we just use uh, the way we containerize. Um, once we containerize the foundation models, the next step is uh, naturally build a container for it and make the containers available in your Kubernetes deployments. And with that, uh, we in our evaluation, the two containers are building our progress uh, repos, and we just push them to the Cray um, Image Hub so we can get the image from there. And these are two um, links to the YAML file. So when you deploy uh, the containers on Kubernetes clusters, um, for the best usability, you probably need to have the GPUs. So in the, in the envi environment we used, we evaluate the GPU power consumption on each of the containers. So that's why we need to have the resource, resource request uh, to claim a GPU for each of the models. So there's two models running in our system. Uh, the first one is a Bloom, the second one is Stable Diffusion, and each one of them using one of the CPU. Uh, so that is, what, um, all the, by the way, all the setup, environment setup, and uh, many, uh, YAMLs are available in the GitHub repo that we provided for this demo. So once we have these um, deployments available, we create a service. The, ser the idea of the service is to make the uh, foundation model access available for both the end user, as you see in the previous uh, uh, UI, so you see, you can have this UI to manually type your uh, prompts, or just go into the stable diffusion. You create your image, or in our later evaluation, we use this uh, service to inject tokens, so we can evaluate the response and also uh, generate the workload, so we can measure the power consumption. So that's how it works. So the whole process making this um, evaluation, the measurements happen is that so we first of all create the necessary resources for each of the deployments. Uh, we have to install NVIDIA GPU operator because that's the uh, platform you, we evaluate. We create the uh, GPU request, so each of the models will run its own, its own GPU, uh, Bloom and the stable diffusion. And then we use in the NVIDIA uh, data center graphics uh, monitoring stack, the DCGM exporter, in conjunction with, with Prometheus to obtain the utilization as well as the frequency and the power information uh, and on top of which we do the queries to obtain performance provost information. And we discuss how that information is used to derive the relationship of um, how to optimize your workloads energy consumption without losing performance. Um, the analytics, which is very interesting, uh, is going to be pro uh, this, you know, further deep dived by Chen Wang. Um, a little bit about the uh, energy conservation and uh, power optimization. So the theory is uh, DVFS, dynamic voltage frequency scaling. Uh, so as you all know, the energy used by the GPUs uh, introduced by the uh, circuits, right? The electronic circuits. Uh, as running at a higher frequency or running at a higher voltage, we consume more energy than lower frequency or low voltage. Oftentimes, the best tune is to tune the frequency under which the GPU or CPU is running, so you can reduce the energy consumption, but that will come as a cost of delaying the execution time, um, extending the execution time. So the lower the frequency, the more time you're gonna spend on the same device running the same program. So how can we get the balance of achieving the most optimal frequency and execution, which is the performance metrics, such that our performance will not be degraded while the overall energy consumption will be re reduced. So that's the, um, the uh, goal we want to achieve using the DVFS-based tuning. So on NVIDIA GPU, you have three ways to do it. One is that you just put a power capping and rely on NVIDIA's own uh, internal mechanisms to reduce the overall, uh, to cap the power consumption for your workload, which we are going to discuss has its own limitation. The second one is that you can just adjust the frequency under which the op uh, GPU operates. So there's two frequencies you can tune. 
One is the, the three main multiprocessor, the SM units. This is basically the computation frequency you can tune. And the other one is the memory clock. Uh, that means the, how fast the data being transferred between the memory and uh, the tr uh, processing units. Um, in the environments we are using, the V100, we can only tune the SM uh, frequency. The memory frequency cannot be tuned. The very last one is the voltage. If you operate at higher voltage, same frequency, then you consume more uh, higher uh, power. Uh, but on the NVIDIA device itself, uh, the voltage is not tunable. Uh, but as you know, if you are running for your own laptop, you probably can have some other ways to tune the voltage. But this is not as possible on the uh, data center GPUs. So we are only focused on the first power capping, and the second, the SM uh, units frequency tuning, and see how much uh, performance and energy changes we can get. And uh, with that, I will hand off to Chen, and she will explain and show you the demo. Thank, uh, thank you, Huami. Uh, a little bit about myself first. Um, uh, Chen Wang, I uh, am a staff research scientist in IBM Research, and I was like uh, mostly focusing on Kubernetes and cloud native stuff uh, in the past uh, five years. And recently, I'm moving to a more AI system support, especially cloud native AI system or platform. So um, just come to me, drop, drop by for chat if you have any questions related to, it, to those. And uh, so about uh, this talk, uh, everything, um, I'm, I'm going to more uh, technical details here. And then we have the GitHub repo. Uh, so you can scan the barcode, get the full tutorial. So the whole uh, setup to set up Bloom server, stable diffusion server with all the GPU tuning only takes around 30 minutes in your Kubernetes cluster. And uh, so um, like, let's first take a look at the two control knobs Huami already mentioned. Uh, the first one uh, that you can do the uh, energy conservation on GPUs is NVIDIA GPU power capping. Uh, it is a feature that allows users to set limits on the power consumption of your uh, GPU. So if the GPU workload demands more power than the cap allows, and then uh, the GPU may reduce the or uh, dynamically adjust the clock speed or other performance parameters to stay within that limit. And the conversely, if the workload doesn't consume uh, more than the cap, and then the uh, GPU will just operate normally uh, without any throttling. So you can simply use the NVIDIA SMI command line tool uh, to take a look at your GPU, what are the minimum and maximum uh, power limit you can set for your GPU. And then to set your GPU power capping uh, is also simple. Uh, you just need to sudo and use the NVIDIA SMI uh, to specify your GPU ID with the new power limit you want to set. So this is an example I tested on my uh, own GPU server. And um, so on the right, if you uh, show the Show, so show the range, it will show you like minimum power limit and a maximum power limit. And then another uh, pretty useful knob is called uh, the, the GPU clock frequency setting. So it's a tool that can help you manage the performance and power setting of your GPU, um, including modifying your GPU clock frequencies. So exactly you can run like NVIDIA SMI uh, dash Q dash D with supported clocks to list all the supported frequencies you can set to. So it includes both the uh, memory frequency setting and the graphics unit frequency setting. And then it ranges from like 100, around 100 megahertz to up to like, um, uh, 1,300 uh, megahertz. So uh, it, it's just for uh, V100 GPU. And then for other devices like H100, A100, uh, it may vary. And uh, so uh, similarly, you can specify the GPU ID, specify memory clock frequency and graphics clock frequency to change your GPU frequencies. So in, in, in this demo, uh, we will show you how to continuous, simply continuous uh, those foundational models to serve as a, a service in your Kubernetes cluster uh, using open source solutions. So both the Bloom server and Stable Diffusion servers are open sourced. And then we created a deployment file, YAML file, for you to simply deploy it in your Kubernetes cluster with one click. 
and then uh, we develop some load generators using uh, the real data size, real prompt data size uh, from the open source community, and then those data sites are available in the GitHub tutorial as well. And then uh, while we run the load generator to generate a lot of load from both the uh, Bloom server and the stable diffusion server, uh, we can see how the energy and uh, GPU temperature is crawling up, and then how they are using the GPU. So then we, we will show how the GPU tuning and power capping can impact the performance, especially the end-to-end -end performance of each query you are running. So uh, in, in this way, we can find a nice trade-off between the inference performance you want to have from the generative models and also the uh, power uh, saving or uh, power efficiency you want to achieve. So it's uh, totally 13 minutes. Um, 30 minutes uh, uh, demo, but uh, for the time purpose, I just speed it up a little bit uh, into 15 minutes. And now we are in a Kubernetes cluster. So what you need is uh, several tools like NVIDIA, the CUDA GPU driver, the uh, NVIDIA GPU operator, uh, the Prometheus, all the Prometheus stack, Grafana, dashboard, uh, DCGM exporter, et cetera. So then we go ahead to clone the hugging face provided Bloom server. And then they already provide the Docker file for it. And then we don't need to change it to already have the APIs, the GUI, the web UI, all the things you need. And this process, the, the, the Docker building process might take around like 10 minutes to 15 minutes, but I uh, quickly speed up this process. So again, the, there's a lot of nice open source tools about around the stable diffusion models. Uh, they developed the YBUI for it. They provide the Docker file for it. So it's all available online. And then for this one, uh, you can uh, you can uh, have the barcode and scan the link on it. And the tutorial have all the links. And the only thing you need is to enable the API for the um, uh, load testing purpose. So we change the Docker file a little bit to include the, to enable the API options. Otherwise it will be just a web UI. So you have to tr try it manually. Okay, so <laughs> the Docker is not available on my server, so I use Podma. <laughs> okay, when we come back, then we want to clone this report. It's on the my GitHub. It's OSS and a twenty-three demo, and so I already pre-built those um, images on my. Uh, query repo as well, you can easily get it, uh, get the latest version to test on your own Kubernetes cluster. So um, then in this demo repo, we provide uh, the two manifest files for deploying both the Bloom server and uh, stable distribution. The only thing you need to add to uh, for those models is you need to specify like how many GPUs you are using. So here, it's, it's specified limits and requests to one GPU. Okay, and, and another thing is you may want to create a, either a cluster IP or load balancer service to expose your service to external environment. Uh, here, I uh, just use the cluster IP, um, so not expose the machine to the external internet. <laughs> Then, um, so so we um, we use the same server as the load testing server. So we need all the uh, detached screens to po uh, forward the part of Prometheus, Grafana, and uh, Bloom server and stable diffusion servers to localhost, so that our load testing can 
uh, send queries to those endpoints directly to fetch both the metrics and also the, uh, the, 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 the queries. Yeah, if, if you are familiar with Kubernetes, those are just uh, regular load testing <laughs> procedures we will do. So now um, the server, all the ports are forwarded to, to my local host. So in my local browser, we can see the YBUI of stable diffusion and then also the uh, YBUI for the Bloom. And uh, in the Grafana, you may want to use the DCGM um, exporter provided by NVIDIA, and that it also provides a nice dashboard to show you the GPU temperatures for all the GPUs, the power consumptions for each GPU, and then uh, what is the utilization for each GPU. That's pretty useful. So here is the dashboard, and then we can see like for the GPUs how the temperature is changing how the um, power usage uh, is changing. And uh, they also show the graphics unit uh, frequency clocks and also the memory use utilization, et cetera. So let's use this prompt, simple prompt, welcome to Open Source Summit 2023 to see how the <laughs> Bloom server uh, works. So this is a 560 million Bloom model. So uh, you, if you deploy like seven billion model or one billion model, so the quality of the output might be better. <laughs> and similarly, uh, we show the stable diffusion um, server can give you to generate a realistic fo uh, photo uh, based on the prompt. And those prompts are from the, uh, the Hugging Face databases. And uh, they provide really nice prompt data side uh, for those big models. So to run our load generator, the only thing you need is on your load testing server, uh, you install the Python environment, uh, Python version is 3.9, and then we have all the requirements, uh, pa required packages uh, available in the repo, so you just need to enable the virtual environment and install all those package. Then the uh, Python script uh, load generator are ready to go. So now we, kind of start a new detached screen to run this um, stable diffusion load generator, which will send 20 realistic uh, prompt queries to stable diffusion server and uh, uh, to, 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 to generate a load on the GPU. So you can see like if you refresh the Grafana dashboard, the GPU temperature is going up when you have the load, right? And the, the GPU usage is, uh, like power usage is go also going up around like uh, 150 watts. Similarly, on another GPU which deployed the Bloom server, we generate some Bloom model uh, load and uh, in the Bloom server, by default, you can choose like batch size from one to 32. The maximum uh, batch size is 32. And then it means you send 32 queries at the same time, and they will process par in parallel in the GPU. And then so you maximize the, your utilization of GPU. The batching uh, is pretty common for those generative models when you deploy those. And then um, those will uh, improve your GPU utilization, but not hurt your performance much. We, we will see that in more uh, results later. And it, it, those are just IDs and the response time per batch query. And on average, uh, what was shown is uh, the, the, the response time per query uh, for Bloom is around like 120 milliseconds. So if you ever use the chat GPT and then you put some prompt and then waiting for the response, you know, like um, it's really more than one second. 
So, so it, and the, the, this open source model for 516 million blue model, you just need V100 GPU, and then the response time can be easily below one second. So next, we want to try the power capping. So to limit the maximum power you can use uh, for the GPU that runs the stable diffusion. Because we, we just saw like the power usage of the stable diffusion server is around 150 watts, right? So if we lower the uh, power cap to 100 watts, what would happen to the uh, response time of the query? So let's set it to 100 watts and choose the GPU one. So the GPU one first crawl up when after we deploy the uh, load generator for stable diffusion. It's all done. It's changed from 100 watt, uh, 50 watts to 100 watt. And next, we want to check the uh, the screen for the load generator. By the way, the the Bloom generator, if you ch just choose 20 car, uh, 20. Uh, t uh, batches, it, it runs out quickly, so this time we change it to 100 uh, batches, so it long runs longer. And then just remember, this is the number of the uh, response time of a balloon uh, load before we do any uh, GPU uh, frequency tuning or power capping. And then we go back to the screen of the uh, stable diffusion load generator. So what you can see here is after we limit the power capping, the response time uh, for each query uh, goes from 36 seconds to 52 or to 62. So it's almost a double. So um, as long as, like, uh, when you limit the power, apparently your response time will go up. But as long as it's ac acceptable, you can easily use the power capping or frequency tuning to reduce the overall energy consumption of your cluster. So, and if your uh, your cluster is not heavily running a lot of load, and then those uh, latencies are acceptable, so why not just uh, tuning down to save more power? And similarly for the Bloom model, uh, we will change the frequency uh, of the GPU, uh, GPU is zero to 300. So now it's still running at the full frequency and the uh, response time is around 100 and 20 milliseconds, and we use this command to tune the uh, graphic clock frequency. So GPU ID would be zero. The memory clock supported is um, 877, which is now tunable. So we still set it to 877. And then graphics clocks vary from 100 to 1 gigahertz. So let's choose 300 megahertz. So if you see the dashboard, you can already see the, the, the stable diffusion uh, model's power consumption already drops from 150 watts to 100 watts. And then we go ahead, change the uh, the other GPU's frequency is to 300 megahertz. It takes a while for it to take, uh, take effect. And then the next batch of queries have the average latency around uh, 650 milliseconds. And the, 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 the latest one it goes up to 770 milliseconds. And if you check the, uh, you also can use the dash Q dash D clock to check the current uh, GPU frequency.
yeah, graphics clock is 300. So when we refresh the Grafana dashboard on the DCGM exporter dashboard, we can see the clock. Um, so all, all models are still using 100% GPU. Uh, the utilization is GPU, but the, um, the, the power is significantly dropping uh, to below like 500 watt. And we will show that uh, later in the results that that is even lower than the idling power you have. So even when you just run uh, 500, below 500 watt GPU power, you can still achieve um, less than one second uh, per query response time for your blue model. So uh, assuming you don't have any load to your GPU cluster and you don't tune the GPU, uh, tune the frequency of the GPUs, uh, what it means is you consume more power than uh, you enable the GPU frequency tuning, but running the model with not a lot of load. And then you still get less than one second response time uh, for all your customer queries. And uh, later, we, do, we did some large-scale experiments to understand the performance and energy trade-off over different batch sizes under both power capping and the GPU frequency tuning. So the first experiment we do is we fix the, the output generated token lines for the blue, blue model. And then it means wh whatever you input to, uh, as a prompt to the server, so you limit the number of word generated output as uh, 180, and you vary the batch size, which is the number of queries you send together to the GPU from two to 32. And then we enable the power capping mode to different, like varying from 100 watt to 250 watt. So what we observe is like when we reduce the power limit from uh, 250 to 100 watt, and then it doesn't have any impact of the latency. And then the latency just uh, goes down as the number of the batch, the, the size of the batch goes up. That means uh, even you set it to the lowest uh, power capping, it doesn't impact your Bloom uh, query performance at all. And the energy consumption doesn't change either. So uh, you can see if it goes up to more than batch size of four, uh, the, the, your energy consumption is similar regardless of your power capping. So what it says is uh, Bloom model is a, a 560 million model is not that large to uh, boost your uh, capacity or to use the full capacity of your GPU. And then you have uh, plenty of space to reduce the energy but not impacting your uh, query performance at all. And then the larger batch sizes you have, you use the uh, GPU better and then you get even better performance for all your queries. And then, uh, so energy consumption doesn't even increase significantly with increasing batch size. So, and uh, another experiment we do is we change the maximum output token lines for the uh, Bloom server from 20 tokens to uh, 180 tokens, and then we fix the batch size as 16. Uh, similarly, we draw all the curves over a different power capping limit. And uh, it, the left chart shows like uh, after the, 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 the maximum token size is over 100 tokens, then your energy consumption doesn't increase anymore. Uh, so it's okay to have larger output as long as the uh, server allows you. So usually server has a maximum uh, token lines like 200 or 400 per time. Sim just similar as ChatGPT you are using. And uh, so for the Batch, uh, if you fix the batch size of 16 and you see the uh, latencies, the latency will of course increase over the uh, number of tokens because for each token you need to go through the whole uh, transformer network, right? And then, but uh, it's almost, um, almost fixed over the 100 servers. So the average query latency and energy consumption uh, for 100 batches uh, increase as the token lines increase. However, they do not increase further when the token density is uh, longer than um, 100. So 
in, in, in this experiment, just saying like you have um, you have full full uh, flexibility to reduce your uh, and, uh, power limit and uh, energy consumption without impacting your uh, query performance much. And then, so for, for, for v, V100, V100 GPU is pretty enough for 560 million Bloom model. And uh, it runs at full frequencies, even at 100 watt power capping. And although uh, another thing we found out from here is the GPU utilization metric is not a good metric. So uh, the GPU utilization right now only shows that um, one of your accelerators uh, unit is being utilized and then it, it shows it has some utilization, but actually you didn't fully discover your GPU's power or uh, capacity. So next, uh, what we want to do is for this Bloom model, we want to further reduce your energy consumption. And then what we can do is we fix the maximum token length as 200, uh, we maximize the batch size we have as 32, and then we tune the GPU frequencies from 150 megahertz to 1,380 megahertz. And then we want to show uh, over the different stage of the tuning frequencies, what is the maximum latency we'll get for the per, uh, per query latency for Bloom queries. And uh, this, the, 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 the chart on the bottom left shows that um, the maximum latency you will get is one point, a little bit over 1.4 second. And for, for like interactive experience, it's pretty acceptable because I experienced the chat GPT a lot. It's, some, it's really more than a second, right? And then if you run at the full frequency, full power limit uh, around like uh, one gigahertz, uh, the latency can go down to 100 milliseconds. And if we, we um, see the energy consumptions compared with the uh, frequency tuning we have shown here, show below in this chart, the, uh, the energy consumption or power consumption, sorry, for like uh, frequencies below 500 megahertz is even lower than your uh, idling power. So it's just like most of the GPU servers we have that are idling nowadays is completely a waste of energy and they can be used to run those large models without even paying more energy cost. And uh, the temperature, the good thing is the temperature is also below the idling temperature. So for example, in this case, the green one, uh, the, the first GPU is idling, but the second one uh, is the temperature of the Bloom GPU is even lower than the idling GPU temperature. So, um, so uh, uh, this this set of experiments tell us, like for those uh, large generative models, uh, we can still use the GPU when the load is low, and then we can save a huge amount of power from it without sacrificing the performance much. And our future work is to uh, first understand the what is the most um, efficient point of performance per watt frontier we want to explore and how to leverage that optimal point to do some auto tuning for the frequencies so we lower the whole uh, GPU clusters uh, energy consumption. So thank you, that's, that's all of our talk. And then now we are for questions. In an organization, who's running this infrastructure? Like who would be responsible for, for this level of tuning?
like a a custom Kubernetes scheduler that interacts with the NVIDIA GPU tuning based on load. Interesting. Interesting. Does this have any relevancy for cloud? Like if I'm running an AWS, could I do this to this? So yes, for any uh, Kubernetes on-prem on Kubernetes clusters, as long as you have the access, uh, root access to the machines, uh, to the to your Kubernetes node, you can easily tune the power capping, tune the GPU frequency without problems. And uh, how how many people are actually running on premise? <laughs> yeah, for all kind of GPU workload, you need uh, the, it, it may not be on prem, but you may have uh, GPU servers from AWS and you set, set up your own Kubernetes cluster, so. But uh, the AWS doesn't give me a reward for using less of their electricity. And uh, so, so for, for example, if you have the root access to the node, and then the DCGM exporters will just uh, show you the power consumption. I think there, there's a few questions here that we want to answer. One is that uh, if we are want to save it, <laughs> so th the two questions is uh, if we want to save it, can I do it? The other one is uh, can I do it on the cloud? So the incentive from the cloud and the incentive from the end user are sometimes in harmony, sometimes are conflicting. The cloud operators do not necessarily give you the access and provide you the benefits that you, you already said. But the end user want to make it happen with this capability from the cloud. So the solution, in my opinion, is to work with AWS, find these tuning apps, and help you AWS to reduce the energy cost. So you as an end user can enjoy yeah, those benefits. For like a sustainability right. goal and yeah. target. We see it as a positive uh, transformation already happening. So we just need to AWS to, to do more to make that uh, available to the end users. Yeah, this is a pretty advanced use case. Yeah. Yeah. So even idle power can be used to do real work. That is amazing. Yeah, Benefits yeah. for everybody. Yeah. I think the, the custom auto scale is going to be the, the trick. Yeah. But whoever is going to provide the service will win the customer. Yeah. Uh, similar to yours, d does this work, or will this work with the NVIDIA DRA uh, Kubernetes stuff that they just talked about? Do you know the DRA driver Kubernetes, that stuff? No, I have no idea. Do you, ex do you mind just explaining what the DRA is? Um, it's something that I only overheard at Kubernetes, but it's essentially uh, driver for Kubernetes, where it can, uh, Kubernetes is now more aware of what is going on with your things like GPUs okay. and seems like it intersects with yeah. what you could do here. So uh, at a point, to our best knowledge, we have not found any of the auto-scaling, uh, frequency auto-scaling utilities from NVIDIA. So the power capping uh, provided by NVIDIA apparently does not always work. So we anticipate uh, if we are able to get more APIs for NVIDIA and more tuning apps for NVIDIA, then we can potentially make that happen. So all these um, tests and results just show that uh, if we are able to tune the frequency based on utilization, we are able to uh, performance uh, performance and uh, performance for what's objective, we are able to do more, do better than power capping alone. So if the DIA from NVIDIA have the same capabilities, then I think that's going to be a very good news for end users. Thank you. Um, so based on what you've demonstrated, I'm guessing that there can be cost savings also from this um, on-prem and on the cloud. Is that is that correct? Can you validate this assumption? Yeah, I think that is a correct assumption. Uh, we have not quantified the exact benefits yet. Uh, we have not done the scale test to let a lot of people run the test. Um, and we only do this for inference. We have not done anything for trans uh, tra training yet. 
but I, I believe that is going to be a very positive trend for the future. As you see, Chat GPT has been everywhere, and Google's recent re announcements make a bot and uh, you know um, and the other models available only makes the problem more complicated. The energy uh, energy problem more complicated. So the earlier we make this happen, the better we can do for the future. And there's potentially also savings from the cooling um, since there was some reduction in, in temperature as well. I, I exactly, and then it shows uh, even shows that um, you can consolidate more queries into smaller number of GPUs as well uh, as you increase the batch size. And then this is all the machine learning community are trying to do. And then uh, they want to um, merge all the uh, larger, provide larger number of batch sizes in one shot. So um, all this experiment on Bloom is showing that you, even for V100, so we now have like A100, H100, but even for V100, uh, <laughs> the GPU capacity is not fully utilized. Have you seen this model deployed on any enterprise customer or at scale? Um, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope to, I believe customer, I believe customers using models, uh, certain kind of models, uh, but uh, experiments is generic. We pick language model, pick a, a stable diffusion just for um, investigation. Customers who are running the language models or text to image models, should have the same uh, situation as we are facing. So as long as we are using the same, as long as we provide the same methodology that they can utilize on their own end, they should be able to see the benefits of it from there. But currently, have you have any experience with it being used? Um, you know, this model is still very new. <laughs> so I believe the customers, will, you know, the cust uh, enterprise customers will find out uh, limitations. You know, the first of all, they have to make it happen, and then they find a problem. And in the end, we'll find the solutions. So we are ahead of uh, the curve at the moment.